But uh, it's not that that's the first time that China and Latin America have ever interacted with one another. And in fact, ties, economic ties in particular, between China and Latin America go back to the 1500s, right? That when you have, um, with Spanish colonization in particular, Portuguese colonization of Brazil less so because they don't have access to the Pacific, but with Latin American colonization, the major resource that Spain will extract from Latin America is going to be silver. And of course, the Spanish Empire also extended to the Philippines, so that a third of the silver produced in the colonial period from the 1500s to the 1700s, a third of the silver from Latin America will end up in the Philippines first, but then makes its way to China. That the rise of the silver trade actually creates inflation in China, and you can now find pieces of Spanish silver in archaeological digs in China. So there's this long history of economic connections between Latin America and China. They've taken on a new contour in the 21st century. But this isn't anything new, and it's not just trade that's sort of crossed the ocean with regards to the interactions between Latin America and China. But you also have a long history of Chinese migrant labor, much like we have in the United States with the railroad industry, right? That um, by the 1800s, for new Latin American nations, Chinese labor tends to be cheap, the same reason that we hire in the United States, uh, that you can suppress wages even further. So if you'll see any number of Chinese workers working in relatively horrible conditions in mines or in guano fields or in plantations, whether it's in Cuba, in Mexico, um, in Peru in particular, especially on the Pacific coast, you see a large percentage of my, uh, Chinese immigrants. There are Chinese laborers in Panama that are hired to build a railroad across the isthmus during the California gold rush because it turns out that the fastest route to California from the eastern part of the United States is not across the United States. That takes about four months. The quickest route to California would be get on a boat, head down to Panama, cross the isthmus, get on another boat, and head up to California, and be there in four weeks, five weeks. So Chinese labor is an important part of that equation as well as, again, sort of creates these ties between Latin America and China. And then finally, in the Cold War, and it, this is not so much a material connection as it is a ideological connection, because you have any number of small guerrilla movements that form in Latin America in the course of the Cold War, and they will increasingly look to China as their example because the, I don't know, I won't get into the particular ideologies here, but Maoist communism was very much a rural-based movement, right? The China, China's population was and remains primarily rural, and so Mao had formulated a theory of revolution that was based on rural populations and the need for rural revolution, and most, uh, well into the middle of the 20th century, most of Latin American's populations are rural populations as well. So rather than looking to the Soviet Union, which is very much industrial, urban revolution, they looked instead to China and this rural revolution that they felt was more appropriate to their particular causes and interests. Um, the most extreme example of this, of course, would be um, the Shining Path of Peru, who will embrace Maoism in 1980, and they will basically launch a civil war, a revolution that turns into human rights violations both on the part of the government and the Shining Path that will leave about 69,000 people dead in the course of 20 years um, up to the end of the 20th century. So there are these bonds and these connections between Latin America and China that precede the 21st century. But there's going to be a fundamental change in China as well that's really going to determine the long-term trajectory of that transformation, and that is with the death of Mao. Right? The Mao Zedong had been the leader of the Communist Party of China from, the 19, from 1927 pretty much forward that he had been the leader of China up to his death in 1976. But after his death, Deng Xiaoping, who had sort of been marginalized within the Communist Party, becomes the new head of China. First, just sort of behind the scenes, and then he embraces that title. And what Xiaoping had done is, he says China basically needs to fundamentally transform. That Mao had tried to modernize China through any number of extreme measures, the Great Leap Forward, where he tried to get countryside villages to create industries with little ovens in their backyard, but it's it occurred from agricultural production and it happens when a drought hits, so there's a massive famine. And then in response, you have the Cultural Revolution, which is a really violent period in China's history. And neither of those two moments under Mao had really managed to modernize China's economy. And so with Mao's death, Deng Xiaoping turns to, acknowledges these disasters, right? Acknowledges the disaster of the Great Leap Forward, which left tens of millions dead. And acknowledges the disaster of the Cultural Revolution, says China has fallen behind world economy and that they have to catch up. And so after decades of Mao having rejected market experiments, Deng Xiaoping will embrace them. Uh, it will start at the small level, that he, he, but he's the one who moves China toward a market economy. Uh, it starts at the local level where um, 
Small scale private enterprise and services are allowed to exist. He decollectivizes farms so that individuals can own land and sell surplus goods. And he also begins to work with the United States far more. And this is the period where you have, um, after Nixon's approachment with Mao, by the late 70s and early 80s, you're starting to see more interaction between the United States and China because both have something to gain from it. China has the trade and goods, the industrialized goods it can get from the United States to foster its own production. The United States is interested in these trade relations because China is the largest market in the world. So Xiaoping really does move China into this new phase of that's less ideologically driven and more bound by market decisions that are best for the economy in China and for its growth, and that will lead to the growing economy that China will be by the end of the century. And I want to be clear that under Xiaoping, most of the economy is still state controlled, but it's sort of a state capitalism. Right? The, the sort of calling China communist applies in terms of its ideology and its party, but in terms of its sort of vision of what communism is, but it's a, very much a capitalist market. And it's in that context that even while the Chinese market's really consolidating, Latin America is going through its own economic turmoil of sorts that's going to help set the stage for its relationship with China at the end of the 20th century that by the late 1990s, Latin America also embraces market economies, but in, in a very neoliberal model. And it's very much dependent upon the United States and European markets. And while neoliberalism initially brings an end to the kind of inflation that Latin America had dealt with in the 1980s, it ends up taking a bigger toll on the public in general. That I'll, I, I don't want to get too wonkish here, so I'll try to say more detail on this for question and answer, but if you look at the Latin American economies in the 90s, the overall growth does go up. But when you look at who that growth goes to, it's going to a tiny part of the population. So for example, in Chile, 90% of the wealth generated goes to 10% of the population. And social services suffer so that by the late 90s, you really have people resisting these neoliberal policies because it's not helping the majority of the population. And that's worsened by the fact that um, one of the other major trade partners for Latin America in the late 90s had been Japan, or even in the early 90s. And when you get the Asian crisis of 1997 to 98, it basically wipes out most gains for Latin America, and they go through the region as a whole goes through about a half lost decade, uh, where there's not a lot of economic growth. Um, so you have from 1999 to 2003, you see a wave of economic troubles in Latin America. Argentina is the most famous example in 2001 where its entire economy collapses. The president has to flee the country on helicopter because it's so, it's so unpopular. But it's not just Argentina, that's the most visible group. Brazil's president, shortly after winning re-election in 1999, he devalues their currency by half. In Bolivia, you have what are known as water wars because the state has privatized water and people rise up and revolt against the fact that they're going to have to pay more for the essential components of life. And from in Latin America overall, from 2001 to 2003, overall growth is 0%. So even as China's market is growing, Latin America is also going through these economic um, struggles that will lead ultimately to the rejection of neoliberal presidents who had been tied to the United States and Europe. And in a way, I don't love the term, but we'll deal with it. It's the pink tie of sort of more left-leaning presidents. And they're not really, they're typically not nearly as leftist as our media likes to portray them. They tend to just be market-driven, but with a diversified market. And so they're basically saying, we're not abandoning capitalism, but the model that we've been doing has made our citizens suffer, and our ties to the United States and Western Europe have held us back, and we need to have more trade partners in order to diversify and strengthen our own economies. And so they sort of launched this new search for trade partners. And they don't just automatically go to China, that the context here again matters, because they're already a little reticent to be tied to the United States because that historically had been the case and it hasn't worked out well for them. And after 9-11, the United States' attention is elsewhere. So it's not nearly as concerned about gathering Latin American trade relations because of its focus on Iraq, Afghanistan, etc. And that has a real effect on U.S. exports to Latin America. So just some quick data here. From, uh, from 2000 to 2010, U.S. exports dropped from 24% to 12% in Bolivia, from 22% to less than 10% in Brazil, from 28 to 16 in Peru, from 55 to 34 in Costa Rica, from 87 to 52 in the Dominican Republic, and from 89 to 74 in Mexico. And that seems high still, but remember, Mexico has NAFTA. And so even within a free trade agreement with the United States and Canada, trade drops by 15% from the United States to Mexico in that period. And likewise, imports from those countries drop to the United States. 
So Latin America, they're not getting pinched by this, but it's an opportunity for new markets. They look to the possibility of Europe and the European Union, but Europe itself is dealing with divisions internally over the Iraq war with some supporting it and others opposing it. And it offers little appealing to Latin America as it's trying to get its own house in order. Japan would be another possible trading partner, but again, that crisis that 1997 had caused in Latin America makes them leery of turning to Japan. Um, and in fact, Japan's assistance to Latin America from 1997 to 2004 will drop by more than half. And so it's sort of this dual context, right, where Latin America is looking for new trade partners and stabilizing its economy and it has, you know, has materials to ship out and to bring in. And China's economy has now sort of grown and fully accelerated to this market-driven economy that they find each other. And they'd already begun moving that path in the 1990s. Brazil diplomatically recognizes um, China in 1994 and gets maximum recognition as a strategic partner. And that's at a time when Brazil's own economy was out of control and in inflation. Uh, Venezuela will get similar status in 2001. Mexico will in 2004. And it's not China imposing itself. It's the region, by and large, recognizing that, you know, much like the United States have done in the 70s, that's a really big market. And that's favorable trade relations for us. And, and so China, and China really has three appeals. It's the market size, it's that it's rapidly expanding, and it's that they need agricultural and industrial goods, right? That with 1.3 billion people, that's a lot of mouths to feed. Latin America produces a lot of agricultural goods. And even the industrial goods Latin America produces are the raw materials for industrialization that China has embraced. Latin America can provide those materials. And so this leads to profound growth in trade with China, between China and Latin America in the, 19, in the 21st century. Uh, in 2000, the trade of Chinese goods to Latin America was about two billion. In 2018, it's 100, uh, 149 billion. And you can sort of get a good, right, that in 92, just over $1 billion of Chinese exports to Latin America. 7 billion by 2000, 23 billion by 2005, 91 billion by 2010, and up to 148 billion um, based on World Bank data. Um, and that's just Chinese goods from China to Latin America. And much of that growth, as you can see here, it comes in the aftermath of 2008, that the, the efforts to diversify the economy pay off for Latin America and China in the long run with 2008. Because that global financial crisis, it is a global financial crisis. But the ones hardest hit are the United States and Europe. And those are the ships that Latin America had historically connected itself to, but severed by the early 2000s with the discontent over how that works. So that, and China, by seeking other trade partners, also is able to weather the global crisis. So most countries will go into recession, but a good case study is Brazil, where it will be the last country in the world to enter into a recession after 2008. It won't do it until um, the first quarter so. Mar uh, by February, March of 2009, Brazil enters into recession, and by June, it exits the recession. That it's in there for three months, and it's right back out because it's diversified its partners and has become so important, particularly to China. Africa as well, it's doing a lot of trade with African nations. So when you look at the map of countries affected in the 2008 crisis, it's sort of what we would call the global south, Asian countries, African countries, Latin American countries, that weather the storm and take a lesser hit than the global north of the United States, Western Europe, Russia. And so 2008 really only sort of adds impetus to this desire to establish these goods. And the nature of goods traded from China to Latin America has transformed over time as well. That originally had begun as low-skilled manufactured goods. It's increasingly high-tech goods. It's 5G infrastructure. It's high-speed rail. Um, it's a lot of transportation. We'll come back to that here shortly. And then in the other direction, Latin America has also sent an increasing number of goods to China. This is Latin American exports to China. So in 1992, that's not a typo, it's $987 million. And by 2018, it's $122 billion. So you have this profound shift in Latin American exports as China becomes a market for Latin American goods as well. Um, but those exports tend to be on four major economies, the commodities, soy, crude oil, iron, and copper that those four items will make up 59.2% of all Latin American exports to China from 2013 to 2017. And it's not, China's not super dependent on it, so that the oil that's exported to China only makes up 10% of China's oil usage. It is also required, and, and China has also sort of in these trade relations, it's required countries that are oil rich in particular, especially Venezuela and Brazil, 
they have had to make um, oil as part of their loan repayments. So if they take out a loan for, let's just say, $100 million, China will say, okay, X percent of that has to be paid not in cash, but in oil. So that you have some of these connections, these complicated negotiations occurring based on primary materials being shipped to China. And what these goods do then is it, it helps China meet the needs for its growing population to feed it and to have its own infrastructure program and construction within China. <coughs> there have been some limits to this that for years, investors have viewed China, Asia's distance from Latin America and Latin America's distance from Asia as prohibitive. And that's only recently begun to erode a bit, but it's still a very real challenge. That shipping to Brazil from China is just longer and more costly than shipping to the west coast of the United States. Also, there's a strong history, and this comes down to different cultural contexts. There's a strong history of regulatory environments and labor rights in Latin America that don't exist in China. So when Chinese companies invest in Latin America and wanted to produce goods, sometimes they found themselves butting up against constitutional rights for workers that China doesn't protect as much or in protects in different fashions. Um, and there would also be examples of a lack of due diligence in the region leading to complications. So for example, China had supported a dam in Bolivia, the uh, Rositas Dam, but that plan is stalled after protests erupt because the local communities that were going to be affected had not been consulted by the Bolivian government and the government basically puts the kibosh on that dam because it might want the revenue and the infrastructure that it generates from China, but China is not elected the president's ability. So that there have been these kinds of elements that have sort of provided hiccups in the relationship between Chinese and American trade. That said, the impacts have been profound. Uh, in 2000, regional exports, as we saw, were 3.6 billion. Now they're up to 144 billion. And by 2010 alone, China absorbed 25% of Chilean exports, over 15% of Brazilian exports, nearly 10% of Argentinian exports, and it accounted for 14% of Latin American imports. So 14% of imported goods to Latin America were coming from China by 2010. That also affects growth rates. As we mentioned, from 2000 to 2003, growth in Latin America was 0%. From 2004 to 2006, it climbed to 5%, and then returns to 6% in 2010, just two years after the financial crisis of 2008. And additionally, diversifying partner, diversifying partners have helped, and again, this comes back to that motif of because they're not relying on the United States economy, which is going to take a lot longer than 2010 to rebound, or the Western European economies that are going through plenty of problems on their own, especially with issues like Greece or Portugal dealing with bankruptcy in the European Union. Latin America actually has pretty fair sailing in their growth rates in the early 2010s. Not all will accept this without worry. The greatest worry is especially in Mexico, because China could take over, because China could offer cheaper labor, it could provide cheaper goods. So that when China and Mexico were making the same goods, the market for the Mexican goods dried up because they paid their workers more and therefore the goods cost more and there were less purchases of them on the global market. China could also invest with state-led investments in ways that Latin American nations could, just by the sheer size and scope of the Chinese government uh, and its territorial, geographic, and fiscal wealth. Uh, it could outbid Peru on investing in matters. And finally, and again, this comes back to Mexico, but there's considerable overlap between Mexican exports and Chinese exports that had some in Mexico especially worry about cost and trade relations That leads us to China and Latin America today, and where we are in the present, right? Chinese companies have grown in the presence in Latin America, both through direct investment and through supply chains. So they have increasingly become involved in supply chains in order to better control the process of exportation and production of goods from start to finish. So when we talk about supply chains, it's not just I'll invest in your steel industry, but it's I'll build a factory I'm clearing out the ports, I'm putting a railroad from the factory to the ports, and I'm gonna run the shipping company. So basically they can control the process from start to finish, which in some regards is very much like your um, horizontal monopolies, or vertical monopolies in the Gilded Age, people like Andrew Carnegie, where he's going to own all the phases of production from start to end to cut costs for himself. That, as a result, you have seen targeted acquisitions in Latin America on the part of China, whether it's in processing, storing or trading, 
They also invest in factories, processing plants, mills. China has invested in about 150 infrastructure projects in Latin America since 2002, especially in the area of roads, rail, and ports. That's often exports driven, as with the $50 billion bio-oceanic railway that would link ports in Peru with, on the Pacific with ports in Brazil on the Atlantic in order to foster transcontinental transportation of goods more. Likewise, they've invested, as I mentioned, in ports because that facilitates the transportation of goods. The problem here, though, is, and this is one of the challenges or complaints about Chinese investment in these projects, and it's one that we'll come back to here shortly, but has historical antecedent in Latin America, is it's technically infrastructural improvement for Latin American countries, but the infrastructural improvement is not actually for the people of Latin America. That if you're investing in roads to transport materials from a factory to a port, that, or a rail line, that's not the roads or the rail lines that the public is using. So it is on the one hand, like if you look at the total numbers of investment and infrastructural growth in Latin America, they're high. But when you think about the social impact of that infrastructure, it's not as high because it's very much targeted toward the shipping of goods rather than social infrastructure. They've also targeted mining extraction, although they are less focused on controlling the entire supply chain in the case of mining. Instead, they basically rely on legal mining, especially in the case of Chilean copper, as well as illegal mining of um, whether it's gold or lithium or other materials in Bolivia, Venezuela, Colombia, Guyana. And then finally, and the readings for those who have access to talk about this briefly is China's Belt and Road Initiative, which had begun first as this effort for China to still create this continental network of trade across the Eurasian continent. So they're sort of, in some regards, a good way to think of it, it's almost like a 21st century version of a silk road where China could really kind of create this inescapable spider's web of trade that involves China. But um, since 2017, it's entered into Latin America, and at least 17 countries have signed agreements with China since that year. But it's just beginning to enter into that, and again, it hinges primarily on these notions of trade networks and facilitating trade infrastructure. It's too early to really say if it's going to have a profound impact, if it continues, but at least what had initially been is designed and envisioned as, from China's perspective, as a continental matter within the Eurasian continent has now spread its fingers out to Latin America as well. The consequences of this are not all cheerful. If, if you're very much economist-driven and really like data, this looks great. But as we sort of alluded to already with the infrastructure question, there's a real social cost and other costs to this that are not as Positive. And one of the most obvious ones, of course, would be environmental, and we'll return to this as well in other arenas. Mm. But particularly when you look at the soy production. Um, Brazilian deforestation has been occurring for a while. I shouldn't say Brazilian. Amazonian deforestation, as we'll see here, because the Amazon is more than just Brazil. But the demand for soy and for cattle has led to more investment in those arenas in Brazil, and that's led to the increasing clearance of the Amazon in order to have land for cattle and for soy. But the problem with this in particular is the Amazonian soil itself isn't exactly nutrient rich. So you can clear it out and farm it for a few years, but it's acidic, it's humid. Pretty soon it becomes a new, you can't farm it any longer. It's best to fallow for a while. So it leads to more destruction of the Amazon if you have illegal loggers operating the Amazon. The recent fires that have erupted in the despite the Brazilian president's insistence that his NGO is backed by Leonardo DiCaprio, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> it's backed primarily by the locals who want to be, like basically local agents doing it for the wealthy, getting paid for it. Um, and environmental activism, there's a history of activism in the Amazon, but some of the most famous Amazonian defenders have been murdered and their killers, we know who they are, and have gone unpunished because of the imbalance of power between the elites and the masses in the Brazilian Amazon. So there's a very real environmental impact, certainly in the Amazon, for some of these goods like soy. And that's not the sole environmental impact. I'll return to another couple other examples here shortly. But where we are going forward, and the environment's one of those key questions, right? So what is the impact of the legacy of these trade relations on the Latin American environment? The dam, the, the, the forest is a good example, but it's not the only one. Another good example, we mentioned one dam in Bolivia, but you have the Belo Monchi Dam in Brazil, um, which is one of the world's largest dam complexes, 
Uh, and it's very much, um, it's been brought from its conceptualization forward. It is now, has, it has begun operation, though it's not completed, because it faced any number of challenges. Because Brazil says, well, we need more energy. We have to go green energy, but hydro energy is not always green. And in this case, it was destroying some pretty fragile ecosystems, including the elimination of some entire species of birds and fish at a very local level. But also they decided to plant it at a, or build it at a location where the lands it was gonna flood were Brazilian native lands. It wasn't, it could have been put in any number of places. And, and in this regard, it's a sort of similar, I mean, this is a topic that's not common, or not uncommon in Brazil or elsewhere, right? But even if you think about, I'll step into a minefield very briefly here, right? The North Dakota pipeline, where the people in a city say, oh, we don't want it here, it'll poison our land, send it through the reservation, and that's where it goes. Right, that this is sort of broader global trend of, and a historical trend of environmentally persecuting native lands because who cares? Yeah. So if you have the Bell of again, which China invested massively in, but it has this broad nature, and, and there's a global, Chief Raoni is his name, he's very well known for basically trying to mobilize globally indigenous peoples in Brazil, elsewhere, environmental activists to point out the injustice of these problems, right? And people say, well, Brazil needs energy. I, I lived there for a year and a half, and these debates were going on then. You got plenty of sun, you got plenty of wind. Why does it have to be a dam in that exact location? Right, so it's not just a question of deforestation through the soy and cattle industries that are questions of environmental impact on the Amazon, but also questions of dams and infrastructure and how those projects, or even roads, right, and the, the environmental degradation that comes with roads and with traffic on roads. So this is one of the major questions about it's likewise, China has invested in mining, and mining always takes a toll on the environment and on its workers. You have other, and, and again, I want to highlight this issue as well in terms of deforestation because it's a particularly pressing issue. This sort of describes who's responsible for what percentage of the deforestation of the Amazon. Again, Brazil carries the burden. But you have it in Peru, Bolivia, Colombia. Um, and those are just the rates from 2001 to 2012. And it's not always China imposing these conditions. Right? That if you look at the very recent data um, with a new president in office in Brazil last year, <laughs> who basically actively facilitated and encouraged deforestation in the name of economic growth, these are just monthly rates from 2016, the deforestation, deforestation rate by month, and then you hit 2019. So that there's economic gains for some who are not concerned with the environment in Brazil, if they're actively choosing this route for profit in ways that China can benefit from as well, but that hurts the environment, it creates global issues, it certainly has been, you know, climate change has been a debate and a conversation from Greta Thunberg forward. I, will, um, I want to close then by doing the thing I said at the beginning I'm very hesitant to do, is where are we going forward? And as a good historian, I'll say it's tough to say. It's complicated, any number of things could happen, but th this pattern at least seems in the holding for a while, in part because trade war with China. So when, when Trump proclaims this trade war with China, it has actually oddly helped Latin America in growth, even while it's exacerbated these issues as well, because it reduces China's dependency on the U.S. market, even while it creates greater demand from other markets. So for example, in 2018, Chile and China renewed a free trade agreement between the two of them that had originated in 2005, but it increased wine, pork, nectarine, blueberry, and blackberry exports to China. And that hit Oregon farmers really hard because that's our biggest blackberry production and China had been their major market. And with the trade war, they couldn't get their goods out, but Chile was ready to fill in the gap. Likewise, U.S. export, and, and in fact, at this point, China is Chile's main trading partner. 28.5% of Chile's foreign trade is with China, and no country has more. <coughs> Likewise, the trade war led to a drop of U.S. exports to China by 94%. And that led China to increasingly turn to countries like Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay. Part of the reason for that spike is, clear the land, China wants soy, and we can farm it if we get rid of the Amazon. And so, yes, and so then last year, Brazil exported 66.1 million tons of soy to China, which far outpaced U.S. exports last year. So in terms of concluding then, there are real challenges going forward, as we've mentioned, the environment's the major one. There are also worries about dependency, right? That there, Latin America has, there's the whole economic 
theory that says Latin America tends to get locked into being too reliant on other countries taking their goods instead of building internal domestic markets. And so that hasn't gone away. That Ecuador's recent loans, including $6.5 billion from 2007 to 2017 and another $900 million last year, that that ensnares them in debt to China. And in general, Latin America's exports, they're not manufactured goods. They're primary and raw materials to feed or to allow for heavy industry. So that they're in some regards locked into a pattern that goes back to the colonial period of exporting primary materials and having to import more expensive manufactured goods. As a result, um, that leaves them very much subjected to boom and bust cycles, which is another common motif in Latin American history where they can fill, you know, the global market demands are good and they'll profit off of it heavily, but if that market inevitably contracts, they suddenly find themselves on the downside and we've taken out a number of these loans that leads you further in the lurch. Um, labor is another issue going forward, that a lot of times Chinese companies are now bringing in their own labor and they'll be low-skilled and underpaid labor and that both increases unemployment in Latin America because it's not hiring Latin American jobs and depresses wages. And additionally, when you own the entire supply chain, profits aren't staying in that country. The profits are going back to China. So in some regards, there are some, and it's too early to say, but there's some real questions, especially from a historical perspective, that has Latin America perhaps, by and large, in very general terms, just gotten itself <coughs> ensnared in the same old trap as a new partner, whether it's the relationship with Spain and Portugal in the colonial period, or the United States in the 19th and 20th century, used to be, is it just replicating that now with China? There has been, and I even, um, the, when you get deep enough into the internet, there's a lot of scaremongering that China's going to invade um, Latin America and then we're next. It's silly and stupid and foolish. Uh, there are a number of reasons not to worry. China's decision making, first and foremost, is eminently economic. It is not ideological, it's just good business. So people on, I was reading on the internet, and so I'm like, oh, well, all that investment in Venezuela, they're sponsoring socialism to take us over. Nope. Uh, and even in Venezuela, they started to walk away a little bit so that they continue to support Maduro rhetorically, but they're dropping their investments and not floating as many loans anymore because it's starting to look like a bad business chance. Um, there are also points of difference that will make it continue to be difficult to overcome in less influential and non-economic arenas, that unlike the United States, China and Latin America is viewed as an outsider with a completely different culture that you know, the United States and China, or Latin America, can claim some European ancestry not a lot of Chinese ancestry can be claimed in Latin America. Likewise, few people in Latin America speak Chinese and there's little expertise in China on Latin America. So where we, this really leads us that is over the last 20 years, we've seen this incredible economic growth, but it's not, you know, it's got its own pitfalls, whether it's dependency on boom bust cycles and export commodities or environmental impacts or social lack of infrastructure for Latin America. But this isn't some sort of broader takeover of the hemisphere on a part of China, that this is really all boils down to business at the end of the day. Thank you. Five minutes, um, 20 minutes, I'm happy to entertain questions as you have. Mm -hmm. I noticed that you mentioned here about most of the uh, exports from South America are agriculture or mineral. Yes. And most of the imports are industrial from China. Yeah. Well, this, doesn't that have a negative effect like it did on our market as far as the labor market goes? Mm -hmm. They put a lot of people out of business. Yeah, it does that. And, and this is partly, I didn't get into this in particular detail, but there was a phase in the 20th century, the mid 20th century, where Latin America actually, a lot of Latin American countries tried to break that cycle. That they, they increased tariffs on imports enormously and basically create their own industries to try to foster the domestic economy. So when the public rebels against that neoliberal wave of the 1990s, it's in no small part because that neoliberal wave privatized all of those industries. And at that point, <coughs> Chinese goods or North American goods, or they were cheaper and could basically outprice domestic goods into extinction. Are you familiar um, with the uh, Chinese plant that is down near Portland and Gregory, Texas? I'm not. Well, there's a large Chinese steel plant. Just yeah. Built. <laughs> and uh, I know I would live down there until Hurricane Harvey. I thought mm -hmm. here, but the hurricane didn't hurt the, hurt the steel mill. 
But I did notice in Portland, uh, when I first went down there, we didn't see any Chinese. But now there's quite a few Chinese. They bought a, an apartment complex. Yeah. Chinese living in this apartment. Yeah, this is a similar concern to that in Latin America. Yeah, which it's yeah. not necessarily xenophobia, though it opens the door pretty easily to xenophobia, but this notion that basically those are, and, and that's not unique to China, to be clear, that the United States has done this, European countries have done this, and sort of, we'll bring our own workers in there to do it, and that's preventing people, it's, you know, your workers aren't spending a lot of money in that economy, the profits are going out of the country. Um, but yeah, this is a real issue, right? It's part of the broader na na nature of global trade. Yes, sir. Don't they rotate those employees? Oh yeah, they do. That's what oh. the Japanese do too. Yeah, so they don't stay too long. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> don't get too <laughs> Yes. It's from the 70s forward, they have been about the economics. 
And there's not this, therefore, there's not this sense of um, an ideological sort of universal struggle between this isn't an ultimate battle for will communism or capitalism triumph. In the Chinese regard, they kind of answer that question is capitalism and global capitalism in particular. And so pointing missiles now is not, it's count, counterproductive on two fronts. Because on the one hand, like, well, how dare you? We're not going to trade with you anymore. And that will hit their economy. And if they get mad and they blow us up, or anybody up, all right, but boy, you really just lost trade partners now. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think the, the context for the Soviet decisions on that front makes sense. But it's because it's so embedded in this Marxist-Leninist view of global struggle where capitalism is out to get you. And between the Nixon visits with Mao in the 70s and Xiaoping's shift to, a, we, I mean, we still refuse to trade with Cuba because they're communists. <laughs> but the biggest communist country in the history of the world, we're happy to trade with because they're not. There's capitalists at the end of the day. They call it the Communist Party. We don't have to, and I'm not saying, oh, they're filled, they're not so fine, they're great. There are very real democratic limits and issues in China. But we're willing to look the other way because it's good for our business as well, until recently. In fact, oh, well, by the way, that answer was a lot of questions. We'll get it several across it. Yes. When I read the article, I was thinking about the Monroe Doctrine. Mm -hmm. In the last, say, generation, is it just kind of viewed as obsolete? Or? Yeah, I, I, mean, I think so. It, it was always, I mean, the Monroe Doctrine is fascinating for, I'll try to be as weird as I can, but it was always weird because it was misinterpreted. Um, like, even when it's first created, it's a very loud bark. Because we're telling the British Navy in 1825 stay out of the hemisphere. Sorry, but Britain's Navy is a little better than ours in 1825. Um, and then with Roosevelt, it does get turned into this other issue that's uh, this sort of weapon that's wielded in the course of the early 20th century and certainly through the Cold War. But really since 9-11, it's kind of fallen off the radar. Um, and in fact, there's even, so uh, I remember in the, this was in the late 2000s, um, and the Latin American economies really rebound. And there'd be, thing, there'd be articles saying, wow, Latin America's economy is doing well despite the U.S. ignoring it. And then the, the rebuttal story, it's not despite, it's because. That the United States has got its gaze elsewhere, and they sort of left Latin American economies to their own devices for 10 years, and it turns out they could do well if they weren't beholden to these sort of disadvantageous trading agreements. Um, and that's not to paint us as a bad guy, but it's just always like, weird. We quit working heavily with them, and all of a sudden, they did really well. What are the odds? Like, pretty high, actually. <laughs> yeah, up here, then over there, yes. Trade, 
but I want some of the profit to go to the masses. I want to create more social safety nets for them. Uh, we'll create a program where we'll pay you for your kids to go to schools so that they're not working, so we can have better educated workers, therefore better jobs with better incomes. Right? That this is how they're invested instead of yeah, instead of smarter labor, instead of just well, if you're broke, send your kids to school. Etc. Oh, back here, and then we're up here. Yes. Sir. China has 1.3 billion people. Yes. What's their problem? <laughs> They've got to feed them. Yes. So everything they're going to do, if you don't feed them, they are, they tend to get unruly. Yeah. <laughs> and when you want 1.3 billion of them, you better feed them. How do you feed them? You get an economy that works. Yeah. And then you find the places that can raise your food. This is not complicated. No. Don't make it harder than it is. And don't make it political. Yeah. And, and that's where the Communist Party element comes in, too, is they're comfortably political because they know they're eventually too big of a draw. So the Tiananmen Square is right there. They were hoping, like, the world, especially, like, you're a prize. All right, we'll weather it because you're going to come crawling back. And by 1994, the Western Europe and the United States, like, do you want to trade with us again? Because they're too big not to. Yeah. If anyone's too big to fail, it might be. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Um, economics, uh, prospers or suffers in, in a, a geopolitical environment. And uh, I'm concerned about what's happening today. Um, the America First uh, philosophy is America alone. Uh, we're, we're, there's a, a vacuum that's happening with us, that foreign countries don't vote uh, the way that the uh, current administration wants it, because then they don't get our foreign aid. Uh, but yet, military action is, uh, the, the, that, that's the go to. So, um, what is happening in Latin America, what China is doing in Latin America, is they're doing around the world. Yes. Australia has set limits with them. Um, I read that their port in Sri Lanka, uh, Sri Lanka couldn't afford to run it, so um, the China took it back. And these ports can occupy Chinese warships. Yeah. So in South America, we can have Chinese warships uh, visiting them. Yes. And, and that is really showing the flag uh, in a part of the world that they haven't done. Yeah. And that's nothing new for Latin America because the United States has done it. It's like the whole great white fleet speaks softly, very big stick with targeted towards Latin America. It's a nice country. Yeah, this isn't anything new, but the threat hasn't been there yet. And I think the distance is, I don't, I don't want to say that there's no threat, because um, anything can happen. But the distance, I think, is an issue. Like, the United States can do that in Latin America because we treated it as our backyard. Well, it's not China's <laughs> At some point, a war, in, you know, launching wars in Latin America, that will be costly even for China. Because it's such a huge transport issue. It's just, again, it, it's sort of a, I don't want to say it's a rational choice issue, but just, well, we could do that, but wars are expensive, and they're hard to win. And China itself knows that, go ahead and invade a country. They'll fight tooth and nail for their freedom. I mean, they see Vietnam, Korea, et cetera. This probably just isn't worth it. So again, I don't want to completely say that it's impossible that there could ever be a military threat in China. But if I were a betting man, I wouldn't put a lot of money on that because it's a bad business choice for China, and that's really what they're concerned about. It's because it, they, they do have something at stake. If people cut off trade relations with China, they're going to have 1.3 billion angry people, too. And not all are in the party. Back here, and then right up here, yes. Um, Olivia Dan, who said that he would stop, was that the one that's going to be another Panama Canal? No, so th th there's, yeah, there's, uh, that's in Nicaragua, that China's talked about building a canal, because historically Nicaragua had also, like, Panama wasn't the clear-cut choice for a canal until very late when the canal was built. Nicaragua had actually always seemed like the logical choice because it has an enormous lake in the middle of the country. 
So you just sort of had to dig to the lake, let the lake take care of business, and then finish off the other end of the lake. Why would it still be in there? It's, it's, it's still being envisioned. Okay. And negotiations are still occurring, but it hasn't gotten very far. Um, and it's faced local pushback as well. That at one point, they started to explore the digging and environmental access point out. If you do this, here's what it's going to do to that entire corridor, plus the lake. And the lake is a livelihood for a lot of people for fishing. And also they said, whoa, whoa, whoa. We, and the government sort of said, oh, we'll continue to do studies. And they kind of, they started to go down that road and then walked back a little bit because at the end of the day, the government also did something about it. And that's Yes. China, China's looking at it. Um, no. <laughs> not a lot. No, no, that's fine. It's not a lot because that's primarily U.S. markets. There is a drug culture in Asia as well, but Asia's got its own producers that transport there. So not a lot, especially in South America. Most, yeah. I'll talk about this happily in far greater detail in three weeks. But <laughs> the short answer is not a lot. Um, you mentioned the highway across. Could use the road. So the highway could be done, although it'd be heavy traffic with trucks. <coughs> so that road less so, but a lot of the rail lines and the port projects aren't really driven for the public. And there's a long history of that too. That when you look at the United Fruit Company in Latin America now, that it's, it's, uh, they would build a railroad from San Jose to the coast, but it was to transport bananas. Um, probably just didn't ride on it. So yeah, cars could use that highway as well, but there's not a lot of driving from Brazil to Bolivia as it is. Yes. Uh, I was wondering, uh, how would you compare China's approach to Latin America in the early 21st century with the United States' kind of power diplomacy in the early 20th century? Um, uh, this is a good question. Because dollar diplomacy can't be separated from, because we often talk narratively about like, oh, well, it was the Roosevelt corollary, but then it was dollar diplomacy. Dollar diplomacy can't exist without the Roosevelt corollary. Um, for all the credit, oh, it tapped, got away from just intervening. Like the United States is in Nicaragua from 1909 to 1933. It's in Haiti from 1916 to 1924. The Dominican Republic from 1914 to 1932. Uh, so, and, and that's pretty much like we tried all the policy, and if they say no, we send in the Marines. So, I would say the major, and that again, I don't want to be clear, I'm not necessarily denigrating here, but dollar policy is often spoken of as separate from the Roosevelt Corollary, but it actually was meaningless without the Roosevelt Corollary, and we quickly turned to the Roosevelt Corollary. So I would say the difference is China, in some regards, China's dollar diplomacy is more dollar diplomacy than the United States was because it doesn't rely on that big stick element. Does that answer your question adequately? I guess I was thinking also in terms of how when the U.S. is trying to enter Roosevelt and tap, the major traders with South America are the British and the Germans. Yes. And the U.S. only kind of went down in there after World War I. So I was thinking more analogous to the Chinese trying to edge up the Americans, the way the yeah. Americans tried to edge up the British. Yeah, and in some regards, because we try to edge out the British and the Germans, but the things that are really going to do it for us are going to be World War One and World War II. And in similar fashion, I think in some regards, you could sort of say we edged ourselves out first with the 2000s, where we really did, I mean, I don't think I'm making a big claim here. We were a little preoccupied in the Middle East and Afghanistan for most of the 2000s. Um, and trade relations sort of, not that we failed, they, our attention diverted elsewhere. And that's sort of the, the I would analogize it to World War One, except it's self-imposed, being like, oh, we'll, we'll worry about you later. And then the trade war with China, you know, that's sort of the World War II of this is like really driving people to buy out our own hand, and this is 